And we're recording. Welcome to episode four of the Unpick podcast with me, K, and your host, S. Does this make us podcasters? Oh, how many how many episodes do we need before we can call ourselves podcasters? I'm ready to print business cards. <laughs> I'm I'm giving myself maybe ten episodes yeah. because twenty twenty one can knock us out before we even get there. I think for me, 20, ten episodes in. You know when you can go on Spotify and scroll up with your finger yeah, and there's yeah, yeah, the episodes yeah. load. I think that's when I start to tell. I start to tell you know friends and and stuff because a couple of friends you know I've whispered in their ear like you know I've got a little thing <laughs> going on. Um, but I haven't told most of my friends. So once it gets to 10 episodes, I think that's when we're like, okay, we're kind of committed to this. And also we do two episodes a month. So 10 episodes is what, October? Yeah. If I'm Reminds, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's 20 episodes. No, 10, 10 episodes is, is five. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's May. May. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So maybe end of May, if we're still doing this, if we're still alive and doing this. Then... It's like when you do the Couch to 5K app, I think it's like week two, they say you can call yourself a runner now. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) I don't like running. Um, I did download this couch to 5K. I think I maybe did 1K. It's really good. It's really good. No, it is. It is. But I I just, I don't like running. So this week we're going to, well, we're going to review the week. Well, the last two two weeks. weeks. Yeah. Because a lot's happened. But um, before that, can I just shout out the new Getz album? Listen, I, I I had some hot takes about certain things, but I know that you're a fan, so I I, I respected you. Will not tolerate any any Getz. No, m- what I was going to say, and it wasn't necessarily to Getz, but Getz w- would have been caught in the crossfire. What I was going to say is to all these rappers and singers, stop raiding your grandmothers, aunties, mothers photo family like family photo album to get a baby picture that you can put in your album cover let's be a bit more creative like that's we've been there we've done that now i know get to the three faces yeah so maybe you know maybe it's a new take yeah but it's just a version of something that's been done oh that's just album cover but the the album might go number one which would be an amazing yeah he's got like a countdown or he's trying to get everyone to buy it and um i mean big up green gate green green gate wait We'll talk about this off screen because I've, I've seen him a couple of times. But anyway, he, yeah. No, you know what? I listened to the what's the song that he has with Stormzy where the video is quite interesting. Skate it's giving, Lord. yeah, it's giving me black Wu Tang Clan, like you know when black yeah. people and Chinese people come together yeah. to make you know all that. And that's where Stormzy Stormzy said a couple of jabs at Chip, but he's not yet replied. Now Stormzy. You know what? Let, let, let's not. This is not. A, this is not a music <laughs> review podcast. We're here to talk about news and real people and real things. Um, and I'll keep my thoughts to myself. I think it's, it's a really good album, and um, there's a campaign to get it to number one. So, are you saying I should buy the album? Well, he said if you buy his album, there's a chance you could win. How much money? Not money, but oh. he and Rude Kid, the DJ producer, will come and perform at your house. Um. No, thank you. Um, not where I live. No, thank you. But, but can, wait, I could, actually, wait, I could nominate someone else's house, right? Probably. So, okay. And this kind of leads us into our first question. Could he come and visit you? Because it depends if we're in lockdown or not. That's a very smooth segue. You should pat yourself Do you like it? I'm, I'm, that, was, you know, that was smooth. I, I feel like I know the meme in mind. The one with the guy, like, is wait, there's two, there's two I'm thinking of. There's one with the guy yeah. with the camp chair and he, like, folds it off and he comes and sits down. Yeah. No, but that's when you're watching drama. But I think, okay, I think we're on the same way. Okay. But anyway, before we digress. Um, the roadmap out of COVID was published this week. Mm-hmm. Um, highly anticipated, long awaited, lots of pressure on the government to set out a clear plan. Yeah. Do you want to talk us through... Because you, you, you read up on it. The first people to be let out into the wild are the kids, primary school and secondary school kids. They're going back to school in March. Now, obviously, these are England and England and Wales specific. I don't think they apply to Scotland or Northern Ireland, if I'm correct. The, the government's roadmap is largely England only because public okay. health is devolved. Devolved. To... Okay, yeah. Because I think Scotland is a lot, a lot harsher. I think it's the end of March when this, the kids go out first. And in line with that, there are rules on socialising in public space. So it's lockdown light. So one person can sit with another person from a different bubble, but I think you still have to social distance. And then the second step 
which, which is at the end of March, is essentially it's, what it is, it's more and more contact. And what the government yeah. promised us is this is going to be data driven, yeah. which I struggling to see why they gave people dates, because I think the moment you give someone a date, it just makes it a little bit more concrete and it's yeah. harder to then roll it back. And essentially do what happened at Christmas, right? It's tell people you can see your family for Christmas. And then yeah. a couple of, you know, a few days before, um, you know, they say to you, actually, you can't. So yeah, I, I struggle to see the wisdom of that. It's really tricky, isn't it? Because on one hand, you need to give people dates because the pressure is building to end lockdown from lots of yes. quarters. Absolutely. Yeah. But the moment you give a date, how can the evidence drive the yeah. date? Exactly. You, how can it, As you yeah. said, that's what happened over Christmas. You can't say... Mm-hmm six months ahead of time but it's tricky you have to give a date but if you give a date then you can't claim the evidence has taken you to that date difficult so there'll be four tests right yes these are four things that are contingent on us going step by step into less and less lockdown so yeah one of course which we all know is the government's heavily relying on the vaccine yeah. program kind of continuing at pace as it, as it is so if, if the vaccine deployment does slow down which i think there have been signs a couple of days that AstraZeneca are not producing and not meeting the production targets. So that's something for us to think about. And also if a vaccine shows that it is effective against death and and hospitalization, which it is, which, you know, we have data coming in from Scotland that say that it is effective. And also that the NHS is is, is able to cope. And we had some good news. I think it was today that yeah. the NHS is, you know, it's I think from level five to level four in terms of how it well it copes with the increase in cases. So that's good news. And also that new variants don't arise that then cause us to then go again into lockdown, which is what happened at Christmas with the new Kent and the South African variant. So banking on a few things, banking on a lot of luck. And um, the government says that there'll be a minimum of five weeks between each step, which I I have major doubts about this. And I think You know, you want to hope for the best for your country. You know, you want to hope that normal people die. But I'm sceptical about about this plan. I I mean, I hope things go well, but I'm not I'm not optimistic. Going back to like what we were talking, how we say segued into this, what we're looking forward to post lockdown. I think for me, it's definitely live music. Okay. yes. So so I booked last year. For a friend's birthday to go to see RuPaul live. Say yeah, li- really? yeah, 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 yeah. Um, shout out to Nadia. Yeah. So it was her birthday and what well, perform like the musicals yes. and all of that. Yeah, yeah, the live one. Yeah, you know all the songs in the show actually from yeah. the live show. Yeah. So bought a couple of tickets to go see that, and then get it was pushed to the last May, and then it just kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed. If you were a fan, I would have bought more tickets. I didn't know. So I, did, I see your lockdown brought you closer to to good things. RuPaul's Drag Race was definitely a lockdown discovery. Oh, I see. Uh, if I'd known, because I was ready to buy, f- I literally asked every single person I knew, like, do you watch this show? Because we can all go. Well. So that's the one thing I'm definitely looking forward to is is that. But I think more importantly, just for my mental health is one, mm-hmm. all my loved ones do get the vaccine. Um, and I've done, I've been going around evangelizing to all my yeah. friends, get the thing, you know, get the vaccine. Speaking of the vaccine, I saw, I think, on the New York Times that we don't yet have a ranking of the vaccines. Mm. And it'll be interesting once we have a kind of side-by-side comparison of the vaccine, how that impacts the rollout, because governments might then decide to slow down on the less effective vaccines and yes. while they wait for the more effective vaccines to come. Because I know the Moderna one, and I mean, do check this, is effective against the Kent and South African variants. So, so far, so good. I think the major vaccines are effective. And also good news for the vaccination this week is COVAX, which is a program where the UK yeah. donates vaccines to, to, you know, to quote unquote third world countries. I think Ghana got the first download. Is download the right word? Yes. And I think that's because they were able to prove they have infrastructure for distribution, which I understand why that would be a standard that needs to be met. But what that means is once again, the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable are going to be left behind. The vaccine, another vaccine. The I think Corona will be with us for a long time. Not maybe yeah. not in the UK because we're lucky, but I think around the world. And that brings us on to another segue, which is the vaccine passports. Because yeah. what you're going to have by the end of the year is different levels of vaccination across the world. So in Europe, hopefully, once the EU kicks in their program, we may be able to travel within Europe and maybe America if Biden ramps up the vaccination yeah. over there, which which is doing quite well. 
we may be able to go to certain countries but not be able to go to other countries and 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 also i think it's also fair that countries are going to expect visitors to have proof that they've been vaccinated and by what vaccine like you were saying for example it might be a tiered system where if you are vaccinated by another you know a particular vaccine maybe you're allowed or you're not allowed so or you vary the amount of days you spend in quarantine depending on the vaccine that exactly. you've got. And yeah, one of the things exactly. that happened since we last recorded, I don't know if it happened just before, was the managed quarantine service. So this hotel thing. When, yes. Um, Shambles. I mean, £1,500 to spend. Yeah, the holiday has to be worth it because I feel like after two days back from holiday, I feel like I've undone all the good I've done. I mean, <laughs> to spend 10 days in basically in an airport. Once I was flying and the plane was... Delayed feels like a euphemism for <laughs> the, <laughs> the airline wasn't working for three days. So I was stuck. Three days? So did, they put, in, did they put you up in a hotel or anything? Also, put you up sounds like, because you say to someone like, fly over, I'm going to put you up. Or yeah. all expenses paid, we'll put you up. Uh-huh. Pointing me to like the nearest, cheapest hotel is not putting me up. I mean... They did you one better than just throw a sleeping bag at you and say, hope for the best. Let's go back to the topic. So vaccine passports. Now there's been a massive debate raging about vaccine passports, yay or nay. And also Michael Gove is the one who's responsible for running an assessment as to, you know, whether vaccine passports are something that we can have in the UK. Even though I did see a clip where he said months ago that categorically there were no vaccine passports. So confusion all around. There is a deadly virus spreading through society. Mm-hmm. don't you just want to have it to frame it or something to be like yes i got the vaccine <laughs> been there done that got the t-shirt got the mug like what what is people's problem with just being able to say i am not a danger to the rest of you and i, I tweeted yesterday that it's funny how some of the people who are who are demanding ids for voting mm-hmm. when they're historically low levels of yes, voter yes. fraud Mm-hmm. are so heated about vaccine passports to prove that you're not a danger to other people. I think what I've heard is that people don't want the government to have a database of all people, but the government does have a database. It just has, it holds them on different, so your NI number, your NHS number, your passport. How do you think you're being invited to get a vaccine? This whole thing reminded me of, you know, these Americans who love guns and have these massive stockpiles. You know, a massive yeah. arsenals or all types of yeah. guns, and they are like, you know, in the spirit of the founding fathers, I want to, you know, if the tyranny of the federal government ever does come about, I want to be able to defend myself. This is America. America has planes and weapons you cannot believe. Why do you think you and your puny li- little gun is gonna, are going to do anything? And it's yeah. the same thing. You don't want the government to hold information on you, sir, madam. Private companies hold massive information, ma- massive amounts of information about you, as well as the government. And this is these, these are people who hold in their hand a smartphone that has a camera facing them. You mean the one time you googled pork sausages, and for the rest of the rest of the month, you got <laughs> you've got all these alerts to all kinds of animal products because the cookies are held on your on your search engine and blah blah blah. This is the modern world. Privacy is not what it used to be. I just I just don't understand. So you're reluctant because you think the government's going to hold data on you, but the government, already as you said, data. already holds data on you. Mm-hmm. But what is your counter solution? So that what the, the government airdrops vaccines, <laughs> so that it doesn't know who you are. No, no, because so so there's so so the, so these non you know these people who are against vaccine passports are in different camps. So you have one camp of people who believe the vaccine, I mean the the virus doesn't even exist, and so in a way they're sort of consistent, right? There's a level okay. of consistency, right? There's, they've, they've built themselves a house of cards and it's still a house. It's just a weak house. All right. So box one, people who don't care, who don't believe in, the, in COVID. So that, right. So there's that group. And in a way, they're intellectually consistent, right? There's a consistency. Well, why am I getting a vaccine for something that doesn't exist? And actually the vaccine is just, right. could have a tiny chip that can control me, whatever, but it's unnecessary because yeah. the, the virus doesn't exist. And the second camp yeah. are people who do accept that the virus does exist. And this is the Lawrence Fox camp. Yeah. But they don't think it's dangerous enough to warrant the level right. of action that the government has had. They don't believe in lockdowns. They don't, then that means, of course, they don't believe in any government interventions such as a vaccine. And then I think you have the the third camp who do believe the vaccine is real. The virus is real. The vaccine is effective. They accept the data. 
but they want there to be a level of choice. They don't want to feel, they don't want to, they feel like they're being forced to get the vaccine, you know, because they, they want to be able to kind of freely, like you said, roam amongst us and have zero regard for the fact that you are a danger unto other people. Because what we found out, lots of vulnerable people for different reasons who may not be able to take the vaccine. This could involve pregnant women. This could involve certain, you know, young children because, you know, the vaccine schedule begins not at birth, but, you know, a few yeah. months afterwards. This involves cancer patients, old, certain older people, immunocompromised people. There are lots of vulnerable people walking amongst us. There's a reason why not everyone can get the vaccine. And I heard someone liken it to the driving license, which, yes, the dri- having a driving license is inherently discriminatory because if you don't have a license, you can't drive. Yeah. And, and essentially the point was day to day, you accept government mandated levels of discrimination based on certain things because no one wants to drive their, you know, drive on the road yeah. and know and, and and know that actually only people who've passed a test of competence that they can see, they know the road rules, they can make good decisions are on the road. Same thing with teachers, same thing with doctors, right? There's a level of actually I want certain standards to to be held before yeah. I accept certain, you know, certain responsibilities of other people. So for me, I don't see it any differently. I think I think you do have a choice. I think if you don't want to get the vaccine, that's fine. But I think if you are you own a pub or you own a public, you know, sort of a public meeting place, I think it is fair to say, you know what, I only want people yeah. who have been vaccinated or have a medical exemption and a valid medical exemption to not get the vaccine and, yeah. and thereby are protected because of herd immunity. And I think that's fair. If you are vulnerable enough not to have the vaccine, you're probably very vulnerable to COVID anyway. So Exactly. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be in the club. I, I just. <laughs> I mean, maybe you want to go out in a blast. You don't know their life. You don't. You don't need to be there, if you because because that's a danger to you. Like if you're pregnant mm. and you should be shielding it essentially. But, yeah. Um... But I understand the whole thing about you know I, I'm not, I don't support the idea that we let's just lock away all the vulnerable people till like twenty twenty whatever. But how about the argument? So you know we talked about I think in the last episode about you know vaccine hesitancy in minority communities who also happen yeah. to be particularly affected by COVID and that sentiment still exists. And I think forcing, essentially forcing people to take, to have a vaccine passport if they want to travel, if they want to maybe participate in public activities does seem, does add, I think is another arrow in the quiver of people who think that there's a government overreach, who don't trust the government. And these, you know, I would just want to say before we continue that there are valid concerns about the vaccine because of the government and government distrust and all of that history but your reasons for hesitation are not correct if that makes sense but also one last thing there is something called a yellow vaccine passport a um, yellow fever passport i think you i don't know if you have a card but it's this yellow yeah, card yeah right that is what a vaccine passport for covid is before you enter certain countries you have to have certain vaccines covid vaccine is just the same if you somehow yeah. listening and you can't get your head around this it's exactly like a yellow fever vaccine you just say you just say your name the date or when you got the vaccine maybe a code or whatever but it's it's just that um but anyway let's do you want to move on to Keir Stammer yeah so probably our main topic for today it's almost Mm -hmm. been a year since Keir Stammer became lead of the Labour Party took over from Jeremy Corbyn after the 2019 December election defeat which was one of Labour's heaviest defeats I think yeah it feels like it feels like the heaviest defeat in our lifetime so Keir Summer's been leader for a year. Uh, yeah, 4th of April 2020 is when he came. I think it's fair to say he had a kind of honeymoon period where he was doing well. He was definitely receiving a lot more positive press. Mm-hmm. But it's felt over the last couple of months that he started to kind of flounder. <laughs> and so this was a bit of a kind of reset moment about kind of, let me reintroduce myself. My name is Keir. Go on, break, in, break out into <laughs> rap. Go on. <laughs> My name is Kit and I'm here. Something, something. I'm here to stay. Now, do you want high pay? Listen, I could listen. Kit, Kit, if you're listening. <laughs> We're here for you, brother. <laughs> Look, we do voiceovers. <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to do a voiceover. Anyway, Keir Stammer. So, Sir Keir Stammer. So, he's a sir, if you care about that sort of thing. Yeah, so, big speech this week. Do you want to talk us through the the elements of the speech? Yeah, so I read the speech first and then watched it. So when I... And it hit differently. Yeah. But we'll, Was it like we'll a go, book versus film thing? 
you know, Harry Potter will never be the same. So let me just give a breakdown of the speech. So it was called A New Chapter for Britain. So it was yeah. very in line with the, you know, like you were saying, the reset um, just in, you know, just a few couple of weeks ahead of the March budget that's going to come up soon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so this, they thought this is the moment. Let's reintroduce Keir to the people. Mm -hmm. So when I read this speech, I thought it was a very good speech. I thought it was a very strong speech in that it had a little bit of something for everyone. So there was a lot of pro-business talk. There was a lot of mention of the economy. Certain, I think he, there were some policies that he put forward. There were government bonds. There was recovery bonds, I think he called them, that government should put out. There was also talk on um, equality, civil rights, which you know was going to hit a particular demographic of labour. And the economics talk is, I think, I think that was a mention, that was a nod to ex Labour voters who voted for Tories. Yeah. So there was, there was a little bit of everything for everyone, but there was notable silence on Brexit. I think. And then when I watched the speech, there were journalists who asked questions afterwards, yeah. and they asked about the government bonds, and his answer was a bit was a bit shaky. The re reading the speech and seeing the speech, two different experiences. There was there were a couple of things that I. I wanted to, I, I thought were quite striking. So he talked about something. He said, under my leadership, Labour's priority will always be financial responsibility. And this is a, a direct shot to people who say that, you know, when left, left-leaning left people in government, yeah. the budget just balloons. And we know that's not true. Yeah. Like, we know that's not true in America and in the UK. Yeah. That it, that's just simply not true. And it's, I think that was an answer to the claim that people on the left are spent the rift. And I thought, okay, fine. Um but this is the one line that I think really hit home to essentially what the central argument is. And he said, but none of this is possible if you don't believe in the power of good government. And I think that's that that's the real question. Do you believe that the government is capable of doing good? Because if you believe that the government is largely good, then it makes sense that you are a proponent of policies that increase social mobility, decrease inequality, injustice, etc. And if you feel like the, the government is something to be reined in, then you are a proponent of personal responsibility, small government. And I think that those are the two different poles that we have in the in this country. So I after I watched the speech, did I feel like I knew who Keir was? Did I feel no? But I think I'm eager personally I'm eager to see what Keir has, you know, what, what more Keir can do, can say for us. And um, and then I also watched the PMQs. Did you, what about you? Did you read the speech, watch the speech? I have a couple of problems with the speech. So mm -hmm. I particularly have a problem with this Labour's priority will always be financial responsibility thing. Yeah. Because you're accepting the premise. Exactly. It was spending on schools and hospitals that caused a financial crisis. It was not. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't spending money on teachers and dinner ladies and, that's not what caused the financial crisis. When you talk about financial responsibility, you're basically, you're using the language of the Tories. Mm -hmm. And that does, to me, does not seem like a good idea. We've got one of the most financially responsible governments we've had in a while. You saw the Matt Hancock case this week where he was, he lost a high court case. Contracts have been given left, right and centre to every Tom, Dick and Harry who's happened to have a share a drink with the Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. I have a more kind of long-term problem with the speech as well so the central argument is this if you believe in the power of good government you can then demand that your government does all these things but if you don't believe in government then you don't really think it's the role of the government to fix the things that are wrong in your community that are wrong in society that are wrong to fix schools to fix hospitals to fix roads all that yes. Kind of stuff yes fine i agree with that it's not an abstract question do people genuinely believe in good government the last 10 years have undermined people's belief in government. So at the next election, people will have so little faith in government as a concept. Your pitch can't be, do you believe in the power of good government? Because people yeah. don't believe in the concept of government at all. Because we've seen so much madness over the last 10 years. The mere idea of government is just toxic lots of people. So, yeah. for example... If you live in the north, you feel abandoned by Westminster. If you live in Scotland, Westminster feels super super distant. Mm -hmm. So you're not really buying. You're not really selling people in the north. You're not selling people in selling to people in Scotland. Northern Ireland is a special case because Labour doesn't campaign in Northern Ireland, so there are no seats to be won in Northern Ireland. 
And then Wales, we'll see what happens in May with the election. But to me, this is maybe the central problem with Keir. And maybe with like left-leaning politics in this country, you're chasing the votes without making the argument. You need to convince people. Part of the problem, you and I were texting the other day about this whole patriotism and flag approach. Mm-hmm. Look, I didn't study any of this stuff, so this is like coming straight, straight off the dome, freestyling. Right? <laughs> there are two like theories of how you win elections. One, you say people have fixed ideas. You just need to find the coalition of people you can bring together to win the election. So you're crafting your message to hit different groups. But you, mm-hmm. you broadly believe that people have basically fixed ideas. So you take everybody and you give them labels and you say, okay, do mm-hmm. I have a message for label A, for label two, for group this, for group that? Mm-hmm. A second theory of how you win elections, you go, people are open to argument. People are open to be convinced. So all we need to win is to win 35% of the seats. Mm-hmm. Can we find 35% anywhere rather mm-hmm. than can we convince 35% of people? Mm-hmm. And I think here somewhere in between. Is the speech going to convince anybody to change their mind? Or is it signaling to some people like who already believe in good government, I am your person? Mm. I was going to say, um, so something you you said earlier about in the next election, the general, which is going to be in four years, I believe. 2024, yeah. You're going to have a situation where the, lab- the, the, the Tories have essentially broken down government into... What is that line by Grover Norquist, who is an American co- political commentator, where he said he wants government to be so small he can drown it in a bath, in the yeah. bath, right? And essentially, that's what's going to happen. They're going to break down public services. When people say they're going to break down the government, the government is public services. The government, yeah. the UK, the government is hospitals, it's schools, it's universities, it's roads, it's infrastructure, it's everything, right? And they're going to break it down so much that in three years, when they say to you, when you've lost all your faith in what government can do, it makes sense for the person who's like, you know what, I'm going to give you the smallest government. Yeah. And because what, what they do is, is twofold. What the Tories do is twofold. One, on one hand, they're going to break down the government into tiny, tiny, tiny pieces and sell it off. Right? Yeah. So no services for you as an individual. And at the same time, they're going to scare more of you into what big government looks like. Yeah. The Labour Party, they're going to go into your schools and they're going to, they're going to teach um, critical race theory. They're going to teach about the British Empire. They're not, they're not nationalists. They're not national. They don't believe in Britain, right? The whole slogan was believe in Britain, right? Project fear, right? And so what you're doing is you're creating people who distrust the government for valid reasons, by the way, right? For valid reasons. Yeah. I can see yeah. why someone says, I don't trust Matt Hancock in power yeah. to run the NHS, et cetera, right? So for valid reasons, you're giving them valid reasons to not trust the government. And at the same time, you're scaring them into what, big government looks like because there is this foregone conclusion that government is bad right and then and there was a yeah. line here in the speech where he said the truth is whoever their prime minister is the conservatives simply don't believe that it is the role of government to tackle inequality or insecurity they believe a good government is one that gets out of the way rather than builds a path to a more secure future yeah. essentially the central question is what is the role of the government and i think we should all agree it's good governance in whatever size that looks like, it's good governance. If your government says to you, all we're going to do is build roads, I want the government to build the best roads possible. And I think that's that's my issue, is that there is, it's big government, small government. And there's this yeah. foregone concept that big is bad, is big and bad, small and good. When actually, we should all come to the table, whatever spectrum of the, of the, of the, of the, of the political landscape you belong to, and say, I want good government governance. Right. There's, there seems to be this foregone conclusion that if the government gets involved in healthcare, you're not going to get good health care. The government is involved in running schools. All the schools are going to be really crappy and the fund is going to be really small and really terrible. You're going to have over, over, you know, classrooms overfilling with kids. But there is, and I don't understand why that is. I mean, I guess I do. The, the answer, of course, is excellent propaganda, right? It's con- like you said, it's convincing people that big is, it's, it's good, it's, it can either be big and bad. And this is false, that cost big and bad or small and good. Yeah, I think, so I've got a question for you, but before that, we live in a country, but also we live in a kind of society where everything you buy, you leave a trust pilot review. Mm-hmm. So apart from politics, everybody else, most of the time, has this very clear relationship in their head between the money I spent and the services I get. Mm-hmm. So maybe Labour needs to tap into that mindset. What review would you give this government? 
what mm-hmm. services are you getting? And maybe take it away from these like high ideas and just really drive it home. Are you getting what you paid for? The other big question for me is, and this is partly what our podcast is trying to look at, what is the Keir Starmer pitch to the black community? Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, the, I'm going to caveat this and we're going to say this every single time we have these conversations that we're not one group. We don't all have the same values. We don't share the same beliefs and we don't all have the same interests. So, I mean, there's us and there's Sean Bailey. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely. right. Mm-hmm. I think there's a difference between saying, what does the Labour Party offer you as an individual black person mm-hmm. versus what it offers the black community? They're kind of like community interests, which mm-hmm. you can speak to without addressing every single person's individual interests. So is Labour the quote unquote, the natural home of black people in this country? So, yes and no. Before this whole revamp and redo, there was a leak that said that the Labour the Labour Party was sort of going to pivot towards a more nationalistic um, approach. Yeah. And I, and I was very keen to note on the, on the, when I watched the speech that there was a there was a union jack right next to Keir Stammer, which is not you know it's not an issue. And it depends on you know what you're using it for, etc. Yeah. Right? So if you're a black person or a brown person, or I think let's let's go if you're a black person in this country, and you your lived in experience is one of and and we're talking about now let's talk about stereotypes and let's talk about like you know averages right the law of averages yeah. right yeah if you have seen some form of police brutality some form of mis like you know mismanagement of your health conditions in the nhs because of historic racism medical racism like we talked about if you if you send your kids to poor schools because the schools nearest to you are just happen to be really bad if you live in an inner city where most black people tend to live in inner cities in the uk where the air pollution levels are ridiculous right um the kids are actually dying yeah right and i think there's a court case coming up where um maybe we'll talk about that in another episode right so if that's your daily experience right you then look at the party that speaks to that because when I look when I look at when I looked at the speech and one of the reasons I said earlier on was for me this was a good speech is because for me I felt like it did speak to me and my community. I may not have personally experienced things that I've just talked about of police brutality, of you know medical racism, but that may be because I am young, so I don't have health concerns that have needed you know sort of expert care and particular attention, and that's why I've not had a chance to slip through the cracks, right? So that doesn't directly speak to me, but it speaks to an experience of the people that I know and people I care about. And in this speech, there was a there was a there was a conversation about there was, first of all, there was, a, there was an acknowledgement of the fact that the black experience, the white experience, the Asian experience in this country are different. Yeah. That race plays a part. Then I look over to the Tory party where Liz Truss talks about racism and sexism and and transphobia and homophobia as fashionable issues. I, then I think in if to then to answer your question, yes, the Labour Party is your natural home because at least there's an acknowledgement of your problems. Then you go to the Tories on the other side who essentially, dare I say it, is gaslighting. You know, they're literally telling you you are not facing these problems, even though the government will 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 independently look at certain issues. It was the same government that looked into what communities were being particularly affected by COVID and found that it was the black community. It is the same NHS under the Tories that found out that black women face higher maternal mortality. It's the same government that is saying that money in the hands of black people just doesn't, the money's short, the money is not long in our hands, right? So the data is undisputable at this point. And I would encourage people who are listening who maybe don't think it's true to go and look for this, you know, to go and look at to go and look at these things for yourself, fourfact.org, the conversation, the government website itself. Yes, the Labour Party then is a natural home for black people if that is your experience and that, if that is your experience or if that is the experience of people that you care about, then yes, the Labour Party is your natural home. I say no because any party has the chance to speak to us, right? Because they are conservative black people, they are liberal black people, there's all black people in between. and there is no reason why a group that is diverse in thought has to have a natural home. 
There's there no reason why the Tory... I mean, there's a reason why you have Kwasi Kwarteng and you have all these people in the Tory party who happen also to be black, right? Pretty Patel, etc. right? There's a reason why they're in, the, they're in this party because somehow the Tory values speak to them in the way that they, they don't speak to me. But I think in the UK, it is, a full, it is almost a foregone conclusion that yes, if you are black or brown, you're more likely to vote for the Labour Party. And that's because I think, honestly at least they acknowledge the problem. They may not act on the problem when they're empowered. They, of course, there's massive issues about that. But I, I think for me, the, they meet the minimum standard. I mean, the bar is at the centre of the earth at this point. The bar is that low. But at least there's that right? Because I think one of the things is the Labour Party needs to understand the where we are emotionally in and also in a way where we are spiritually as a community. Mm-hmm. I think I get a bit tired when I hear politicians only talk about police brutality or talk about grievances or talk about racism. First of all, you've not you've not sorted it, but you've been talking about it for ages. Mm-hmm. We as black people in this country are ambitious, we're hardworking, we're driven. A lot of us, most of I'm going to say most of us. <laughs> and I want <laughs> most of us are hardworking, highly educated, driven, hardworking, all that good stuff. So we also need a politics that speaks to that. Yes. And the way the conservatives catch a lot of people, I say catch as if they're chasing them with like a with the an image. Wrong, but okay. The language of aspiration resonates a lot of people, mm. and it's how how you marry those two messages. And I think part of it is saying to people, "We want you to to be your best, but we understand these things are holding you back." So it's not about, I think this is what the government's going to do for you. How about the government's going to get the the impediments out of the way? How about, how about the government's going to take the things that are holding you back out of the way? You know, if the thing that's holding your child back is that your school is poor, we're going to improve your school so that your child can hit their, their potential. I think that's a message that would have resonated with me when I was 18, first getting into politics and trying to find a home. The sense of, yes, I know the police Yes, I know the system, the criminal justice system. Yes, I know I face racism and all these things in society. I don't want a government that is going to try to patronize me and hold my hand. I just mm-hmm. need to get these things out of the way and then let, let me do my thing. I remember once, I think I was 18, a Labour councillor knocked on the door during election time. And I was like, look, I don't know. I'm still thinking about who I'm going to vote for. I mean, I knew I was not, I was not going to vote Tory. <laughs> I was thinking Greens or Lib Dems yeah. then. This is before they, you know, did the thing. Um, <laughs> sidebar, sidebar. Uh-huh. I know you, like, we've talked about this before, but not on the not on the podcast. I am super interested what politicians do after they leave. Listen, after I'm they too, leave, right? We will have a discussion because, yes. So you know how have... Nick Clegg, so everyone knows yes. Nick Clegg. Nick Clegg is now uh, vice president of Facebook, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The other thing I learned though was this: Stephen Kinnock. What his name sounds familiar. He's a, a Labour MP for a Welsh constituency. His okay. dad was the Labour leader in the nineties. Yes, Ken, yes, that's why the name right. sounded familiar. Mm-hmm. So I think he was parachuted into this constituency because I don't, I don't think he's Welsh. Parachuted. And his wife is the ex-Danish Prime Minister. Oh, oh, d- dynasty. Okay. I found out this week. I say found out like it was a secret. I was watching the news. <laughs> she is the co-chair of the Facebook Oversight Board, which is this new Facebook group that's been board that's been set up to take editorial decisions on behalf of Facebook. So it's supposed to be independent. Mm-hmm. But she spent most of that interview kind of like caping for Facebook and saying how great it is that Facebook has decided to hand over decisions to this independent board. Anyway, I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, you were talking about... <laughs> Someone coming to your door, 18. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Good catch. And <laughs> this, so a black councillor, mm-hmm. East London, she seemed so offended. Okay. Do you, know what she, do you know what she seemed like? You know those King James version, like, purist? It's mm-hmm. like she caught me reading the New International Version. <laughs> now, if you know, you know. I was going to say, that is such a, that is such a very niche only a very niche group really understand what you, maybe what you're talking about. Or like, like I was somehow committing some form of like paganism or some heresy. <laughs> mm-hmm. How dare you contemplate? But no, you need to make the argument to me. Yes. You have to marry both that. 
social justice. Because here's the thing, that's only halfway. Removing these barriers only gets me to zero. It doesn't take us to where we need to be. So you need a message that says, we're removing these shackles, and then this is what we're doing to help you catch up or helping you to kind of achieve all the things you want to do. Yeah, and I think when I said the bar was literally the center of the earth, I really meant that because in his speech, he said, if you are... If you're from Black, Asian, or minority ethnic communities, you face structural racism and discrimination at every stage of your life. That is a very, very, very grim assessment of someone's entire life. Yeah. That, that is shocking. You know, and one, like you were saying, it doesn't address the, the plethora of, different, of experiences that we have in the Black community. But also, there is no solution. After that, he just says, the, the Britain of the future, the Britain I want to build, is going to need the talents of everyone. And that's a, towards the end of the speech. So that's like the last chapter, um, the last sort of paragraph. When I speak to people, when I speak to black people, when I speak to my friends, the sense I get, and I just isn't listening to people, there's a lot of pride in our community. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is just like, I just don't want to be seen as a victim. I don't want you to think that somehow you have now, we as black people don't believe in predestination, <laughs> like social predestination. Religious, maybe, but <laughs> like, like, it's got you've got to sell me something more than that. The most mm-hmm. you'll ever get is not being stopped and searched. No, that's not the, that. That is the minimum we demand, and I think it's you need to sell that argument. And I think maybe we've talked about this, like the power of shame, right? Like in our communities, I remember that hearing people talk about you know destitute family members, but no one's claiming benefits. There's nothing wrong with claiming benefits by the way, but there's this level of shame of seeking, you know, you've got your hand out, right? Yeah. So on top of that, you've got in our community, this, n- not just our community, but also a lot of pure, poor communities. And we saw this with Marcus Rashford's campaign, right? So him talking about the shame his mom would feel and he would feel, you yeah. know, going to seek help. When a lot of our parents and grandparents moved to the country, mm-hmm. first of all, they didn't have access to the welfare state. The welfare state was not something that was available to them. Yeah. But also a lot of people came here in coming to the UK lost their social status. Yeah. And so people who've come here, you know, who before were middle class or were professionals or even relatively wealthy. Yeah. Find it very difficult to claim benefit. Yeah, and I was I was just let me just sum up essentially what you're saying about the selling of dreams. Yeah. I will say that I you know, I didn't really see it the way you you know you've explained it. And I think it's essentially what you're saying the same thing, but just flipping the perspective, right? Mm. The go- the government can remove obstacles in your path. That's the government doing something for you. Yeah. But it's to what aim? And I I don't like the idea that, like you said, the minimum is you're not going to get stopped and searched. No, the, the no, the, that's the minimum. That those are basic civil rights. Labour has to sell us the dream of, as a community and as individuals, as individuals first, and then as a community of achieving our full, fullest potential. And that being something that is just a foregone conclusion that in this future Britain that he's, Keir Stammer and the Labour Party are selling us is every single community will have whatever is specific to that community, whatever obstacles are specific to that community, th- the government is being is actively involved in removing it and letting people flourish. And I completely agree. I, I think I, for one, I am, that line for me about, you know, it just felt very defeatist. Yeah. So I think if you're a young black person in 2021, full of potential, full of dreams, full of ideas, that doesn't necessarily speak to you. I think part of it does speak to you if that has been your part of your story of discrimination. But this idea that it's just an inevitable part of your ex- existence in this country, I don't accept. And I don't think anyone should accept it. There are lots of white people in this country who don't face any discriminate, like racism uh, like working class men who don't face sexism, but still don't have it good. Yes. The, the pitch to our community isn't, we're going to take away racism and sexism so that you can be like the working class communities who are struggling. The labor message has to be, we're going to remove wh- whatever your community, whatever your race, we're going to remove these barriers and then we're going to do more to get you to where you want to get to. It's not just this kind of like neutralism we want to get you to neutral and then we're going to leave you there. It's going to be a bit more. You need to sell a vision of what the UK can be. There, is a re- there was a recent um, poll that was done, Unequal Britain. I think it was done by King's College. Or in- 
maybe an institute at the King's College London. But it was this massive, it was this, not it was massive, I think it was like 2,000 Britons were polled across across the political spectrum on just different opinions about different things, especially with COVID. And I think it's something that we really need to dive, like delve into that and understand people's perspectives and understand what COVID has done. And maybe we'll do this in another episode, hopefully the next one, but it just depends on what happens. But I want to see what Keir Stammer does post-March budget. Yeah. I want to see how he responds to that. And I want to see I want to see an opposition with teeth. Yeah. Because that speech I watched, there was no passion. And maybe as a society we should be over performance, right? We don't we want we don't want we don't want a sort of a theatrical performance. We want an actual performance when it comes to goals yeah. and promises and you know pledges to the to, to the population. So maybe I'm optimistic I'm going to give Keir a chance, but I do want to see at the PMQs, I need teeth. You know, I need a performance, dare I say. I, I want to see teeth. I want to see, this speech should have had mention of Brexit has not even been two months. And yeah. what's happening with the fishing industry? What's happening with all these additional charges to people bringing things in from the EU and sending things back to the EU? The fact that we've got 120,000 people dying. Yes, the vaccine program has been immensely successful, but also what's been successful is the fact that the virus has killed so many people. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I want and I want someone who has the language to toe that line and say, yes, I'm going to give the government props on it when it deserves it. But at the same time, let's not lose sight of the fact that we've crossed 100,000 people. Like 100,000 yeah. people are gone. That is the size of a small town. Those people are gone and they're never going to be that. How many families is that in the UK? How many yeah. houses have been affected by its death? Multiple deaths. And that's something that I personally, for me, I cannot lose sight of. And I don't want to even lose sight of the fact that we've got over 100,000 people dead because this government just continually engages in brinksmanship, makes decisions, the b- bad decisions at the last possible minute. And I want to see mm. a strong opposition. I want to see, and I'm not just Keir Stammer, I want to see the Labour Party really not just pummel the government, but also provide us with an alternative. And, and, and a reasonable alternative, a solid economic plan, a solid plan for the, the environment, a solid plan for social justice, a solid plan for the fact that you have working class boys being left behind when it comes to university. Because, yes, I do care about my community, but the black community sits side by side with the white community, the brown community, etc. You know, we, don't, we are not an island in and of ourselves as a, as a black community. Like we are part of the British society. And I think when one person... What's the, what's the Quran of thing about when you kill someone, all of you, is it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like when you kill someone, all of um, humanity dies. That is, that, that is true nationalism. That is the pivot to nationalism that I want to see. Yeah. That's, no, sorry, not national, that's patriotism. Nationalism is something completely different. That's true patriotism. And this idea that only one party owns patriotism is, is wrong. You know, that yeah. pivot that Labour wanted to take towards patriotism. Patriotism is really caring about your country enough to to make sacrifices and to and to respect the people who make sacrifices, the doctors, the teachers, make sure the teachers are vaccinated before they go in to teach, making sure that the teachers know, teachers are not the ones taking these tests for these kids. The teachers are not trained for that. Making sure that we close down every food bank because we don't need food banks anymore. We don't need homeless shelters anymore. We have strong protections for the most underprivileged, the most abused in our community. That's true patriotism. No one owns patriotism. And I think I want to see Labour with teeth. Like, that's what I want. hope that that's what we can get, because that is what Black people are going to buy into. Switching lanes for the last uh, 10 minutes. Uh Um, Final thing of of today's episode. Mm -hmm. Have you got something on your spirit that you just need to let out? this This is very... I ordered a yoga mat like a month ago. Yeah. And they said to me three to 21 working days. So I waited only to find out that they didn't take money out of my credit card. So I've been here waiting. Wait, I've got something. I've got something on my spirit too. All right, then. What did you order that did arrive? I didn't order anything. I just took the money from my account. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I log into my banking app. I'm like, hmm, it's 360 pounds missing. Like, okay, I look into it. Someone spent money on musical equipment 
and herbal medicines. You know, they Look, were trying to do self-care. They were trying to do self-care. Leave, listen, me, listen. Me. You cleanse your spirit, you have a good time. Oh, no. Just not on my dime. <laughs> listen, at least it wasn't something, it wasn't booze and drugs. Not that but, you would know. Cause don't seriously get- though, but still, you will get no karma from this. So have you got your money back still? Yeah, I got my money back, but I'm I'm pressing the musical instrument company for details. I need to know address. I want to see receipts. I want to know names, addresses. Well, are you gonna pull up like Getz is gonna pull up to that one lucky person? When lockdown ends. You're gonna find <laughs> oh. Oh, whoa. When lockdown ends, I'm gonna find you. If the police stop me. They're like, you know, what's your business? Is this essential travel? Yes, yes justice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the business of justice. So <sighs> we'll uh, we'll see you again in two weeks' time, where we'll either do a deep dive on one specific topic, or we'll just talk you through then what's happened in the, in the last two weeks. Yeah, it's, and also to be clear, it's what jumps out at us, so it, it may. Yeah. It may be stories that you think are important and not we don't discuss, and it's just there is so much to talk about, and the episode's going to be so long. Um, we need to learn how to shout out ourselves, so um, let's do that now. Oh, on Twitter, it's at the unpick underscore podcast, mm-hmm. um, and it's that across all our socials. I just feel so silly saying socials. Then don't say so. <laughs> Then don't say it. But it's like, all right, um, I'm keeping that in. But it's the Unpicked Podcast across all our platforms. Um, drop us an email at unpickedpodcast at gmail.com. And we will answer to everything because it's early days. Exactly. And get get you know, get it in now before we start to ignore you because we just have so much mail. When I start waking up to <laughs> So notification. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this has been the Unpicked Podcast with me, K, and your co-host S. Yes, and we'll see you in two weeks. Stay safe out there. <laughs> I like that. Stay safe out there. Yeah. The street is cold. <laughs> <laughs> you should have said that. Oh, anyways, wait. It is still recording. Let me yeah, just. Yeah. So maybe um... I'll. <laughs>